Okay, okay. Hey, everyone. How are you tonight? Hey, Tammy, how are you? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. I have my headphones on because I have my air conditioning going and I'm trying to limit the background noise. Hello, Russell. I don't think I've met you before. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining me. Usually I was Julie. Oh, oh yes, you're right. Julie, yeah. is it Cass Baum? Yeah, that's good enough. Okay. <laughs> My wife. Okay. Well, thank you for joining tonight. Hi to Kyla. I know you're probably busy with the babies. Hi, Shante. Yes. How are you? I will. I will. I hope you all enjoyed the music. I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, my camera keeps taking out of my hair. Um, but I am really excited for tonight's presentation. So this is the third workshop of my summer learning series. Um, as always, I will share recordings of this presentation. So if you need to leave early or drop off, that's totally fine. Um, and then also the slides that I go through, I will be sharing with everyone as well. I follow, I'll follow up um, in an email tomorrow morning with that. Um, so I did get a couple questions that came through before the meeting. Um, I believe I will address most of those things. Um, but as I sent out an email, I believe on Friday, um, I want to make this very hands on. So I will take time to uh, educate and go through some slides. But at the end, I actually want to go through an example of how to calculate how much money you actually need for retirement. Um, because that's the big question, right? Like, how do we determine um, if I can retire or not, <laughs> uh, because everyone's situation is so different. So we'll definitely go through a hands-on example for that. Um, and then let me just get my slides. And I'll have folks joining on throughout the presentation. Some folks will probably drop off. It should be nice and intimate and informal. Um, so I will go through um, and ask for people to, you know, I'll pause for questions. If you want to unmute yourself, put it in the chat. I will definitely do that as well. So um, again, thank you. You guys could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me. Uh, so I'm so happy that I had some folks join and join me live. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Okay, planning for my retirement. Very, very uh, kind of like a, a loaded question. It's like a loaded <laughs> subject because it's no uh, one size fits all answer. But um, for those who don't know me or who don't work with me already, um, my name again is Shantae Moore. I'm a certified financial educator. I'm also an investment advisor representative. Uh, and I just received my master's in business administration. It was a long-term goal that I finally accomplished. And um, I teach financial literacy workshops. I do, obviously with the pandemic, I've done tons of these over the past year. Um, I'm actually going to get back to my first in-person workshop with the union organization on Thursday, so I'm excited for that. Uh, but my goal is to be a resource to folks. Um, I don't claim to be the expert and know it all for all things financial and investing. Um, I've been doing this for over 15 years, and I have a lot of clients who their goal is to retire. And I'm just going to basically teach you uh, what I've learned in my experience, but also the things that I walk my clients through when they're ready, you know, getting ready to take that next step, um, next step in life. So that's that's my, my whole goal for tonight. Um, I always do a quick disclaimer. Uh, this is for educational purposes only, because for me, I, I can't give blanket advice. I definitely will answer questions um, if it's general enough, but some things require me to know more about your situation. But in general, I I try to encompass a lot of information that it should apply to most of the population, <laughs> to most folks. Um, if I go through any examples, they're hypotheticals. And again, you're just not going to learn anything in our time together. I did a lot two hours. I don't want to hold you all for that long. But if, if it goes that long, great. Uh, I Again, I want to make sure that I address anyone's questions um, while everyone has taken the time to be here. So why did I pick this topic? As I mentioned, uh, my summer learning series were based on topics that I get asked the most questions about. 
And whether you're a, a baby boomer, obviously baby boomers are already retired or on the brink of retirement. Um, those individuals are turning 65 every 10 seconds for the past 10 years. So it's a huge population. Actually the baby boomer population, the generation is the largest population alive right now. Um, you guys are in retirement or already about, or just about to retire. Then we have our Gen Xers that sandwich generation in between the baby boomers and the millennials. Um, those are individuals maybe in their forties or fifties, they have adult children, but they also have um, parents that they're probably taking care of or having some responsibility for. And then millennials, um, not saving pretty much at all for retirement, but I do meet a lot of millennials who are concerned about it. They see that there's a need to save on their own and that they probably won't get the same retirement that they witnessed their grandparents or great grandparents have. But overall statistics show us that not enough, not any generation, no generation is saving enough. And so I, I applaud all of you for joining today because obviously if you came to join tonight it's because you wanna be educated and at least learn more about how you can prepare for this. Um, and the one thing that I do know, and then I think a lot of folks are coming to realize is that the old days of depending on our government or depending on our job to take care of us in retirement, that's a thing of the past. Um, there's a huge shift to personal responsibility uh, where we can't depend on social security. We can't depend on even company pensions. Um, do we factor those things in? Absolutely. But the third, the third uh, leg to hold up our retirement is dependent upon your personal savings. And I'll just preface and say, you know, I don't want folks freaking out to say, oh, I don't have enough. I want you just to be educated to know what do you need to do? What does it take to reach that goal? Um, and as I always share with folks, you don't have to do this on your own. I always recommend working with a financial professional to help you implement your retirement plan and your goals um, because it's a, it's a huge undertaking. We're talking about major decisions that you'll have to make that will determine your financial status for the rest of your life. So why not engage a financial professional, someone like myself, um, obviously due to my association to all of you here, um, you all know that I offer my services complimentary based on where I met you all or where the contacts came through. Uh, some of you all are already clients that I already work with, but at the end of the day, whether it's working with myself or anyone else, I highly, highly recommend taking professional advice. And the being the, the reason being is that we help you through this process. We help you uh, work through those numbers. We help look at which where you stand, where do you need to go? Um, one thing that's a huge advantage in working with a financial professional is that we give you access to the world-class professional financial products. So for example, um, I'll talk about annuities later today because they're a huge tool that works really well for folks in retirement. Um, annuity products aren't offered to just the general population. A lot of those you have to go through a financial advisor to get access to the best of those best annuities. And I'm not saying annuities are for everyone or if they make sense, but that's just an example. Some financial accounts or investment accounts, you can't even get access to unless you work with a financial professional. Um, and that's a huge, huge benefit, meaning you can't just Google it and open it up on your own. And then lastly, you know, while you can, you know, there's so much information and resources out there. And I encourage folks to be educated and, and, and have that self-knowledge. Um, but this these things change day to day just because of the pandemic. There were about 14, 15 laws that changed in regards to investments and taxes. Um, you know, we know about like the CARES Act and all those things changed so many things. And you really want to work with somebody who stays on top of those things, who can help you continue to navigate a steady path toward retirement. So now that I've gone through my little spiel, let's get to the meat and potatoes of like, why are we all here, right? Um, the question is, well, how can I retire, Shante? How do I know that I, this is a goal for me, that I can do it? Well, we have to really start with the end goal in mind because some folks, they just, you know, honestly, what I see in my consultations, and I don't judge anyone, is that they think retirement is an age and it's not. 
retirement is about a dollar sign because if you had enough money saved today, you would retire today. But the main thing is that a lot of folks don't know what they need saved to actually retire. And so it's, it's not necessarily about a major lump sum. It's not a, about, oh, I need a million dollars. We don't just pull numbers out the sky. We literally start with the end goal in mind when it comes to your financial situation. So let me pull this up here. And the one question, um, okay, I'll answer that question. Thank you for that question in the chat. I'll address that. Um, the one question, the number one question that you need to answer and write down and actually get a pen, a pen, a pen and paper because we will go through an exercise to address this is how much income do I need to have coming in to my household on a monthly basis when I stop working to live comfortably in retirement? And I look at a month to month basis because that's normally how we pay our bills, right? We pay our mortgage every month, our cable bill our auto loan, whatever we anticipate. How much money do I need to have? Or another question could be, if I'm currently living off of, let's say $5,000 a month, when I decide to quit, you know, quit my job and hang it up, do I still need to maintain that $5,000 income to maintain my lifestyle, to be comfortable in, re in retirement? That's literally the number one question that we will work through together tonight to determine. And then we work backwards from there. So again, if you know right now to pay all my bills, to live in my house, to maintain my standard of living, I live off of X dollars per month and you anticipate maintaining those same bills and responsibilities in retirement, then that's how much you need. That's, that's exactly how much you need. And then we're going to work backwards. Well, how do I generate that four or $5,000 per month? So let's talk about where, you know, how do we do this? So the one question that I always get also is, well, okay, I need $5,000 per month, but how do I create that for myself? Do I invest it? Do I save it? Where should I save my money? Where should I put it? And of course, with me, there's always a general question. It just depends. There's a lot of factors because everyone's situation is so different. There's a lot of factors to determine what type of financial tools that you'll need to utilize to save for retirement. Um, the first question that I always, always ask, and this, I harped on this on my last webinar about investing in the stock market, was determining your risk tolerance. And that basically is how um, how comfortable, well, how much money are you willing to lose to make money? You know, if you have $100,000 saved, how much of that $100,000 are you willing to risk to put in a position to possibly lose, but also for the opportunity for that money to grow? Um, this is a major factor when it comes to your retirement savings because how risky you are will determine, it'll give us a great, a, a good idea of how we can expect how much we can expect your money to actually grow. Some folks don't want to take on any risk whatsoever. So if that's the case, that also steers me in a different direction. Okay, what recommendations should I offer a client? So risk tolerance, probably one of the first questions that I'll walk through with a client to help them figure out. Another question is your time horizon. So, you know, our greatest asset that we have on this earth is time. You know, the more time you have to save and plan for retirement, the better, the generally the better you are to, you know, be successful with retiring and not having to go back to work. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you have a shorter time frame, let's say you have five, less than five years, um, you know, that's when you really just want to be strategic about your assets. That's actually when you do the most planning um, when it comes to any savings that you have or any future savings that you intend to do. Um, another question is when do we need to access our money? Because just because you're retired, it doesn't mean that we're just going to take one check and draw down every account that we have and that's it. And we're just going to deposit in our check account and pay all of our bills and that's it. No, 
generally, you know, our goal is to accumulate a certain amount of money because then we know that that money can continue to invest while we're in retirement. So, you know, let's say you accumulate a quarter million dollars. Again, we're not just going to take a quarter million dollars at age 65, whenever you decide to retire, um, we'll probably just, you know, shave off a little bit at a time, but that other money will still continue to invest and continue to grow. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit later about how do we stretch our money to last as long as possible. And then another major, major question in retirement um, that we have to factor in our taxes, our favorite uncle, Uncle Sam, they will, he wants to take a part of your retirement money from you in the form of taxes. So depending on what accounts you have, um, you know, again, when you plan to access your money will also determine how much you can actually keep, you know, because a portion of that generally will have to go to Uncle Sam first, and then you get what's left over. So we're going to have a really great conversation and incorporate taxes into everything that we look at today. So any other questions so far, anyone? Are we okay? Anything else that you want me to address, feel free to put it into the chat, um, but I will move on. Does this make sense so far? Some of these things that we have to, because we have to take a step back and think, okay, what do the numbers look like? But also, how do we be smart about our choices and our decisions? So let me move on. So before I get into um, like income and how do we factor out that dollar amount? Because remember, whatever that dollar amount for you is that you need to live every single month, that's ultimately what we're going to determine tonight. How do we get there? But we also have other questions to consider because um, a lot of folks, again, I see them pull the trigger on retirement and they don't even think about some of these things. Um, if you have a pension at your job, uh, if you're one of the lucky few employees who still have a pension, um, one question that you want to ask yourself is, have you even been provided an estimate of what you expect that pension to be? Um, and I'll talk about what a pension is, but you're basically going to get at a dollar amount for the rest of your life. We need to know what that is. Um, I talked about taxes. You know, we're going to talk about tax implications on retirement accounts. Have you checked your social security statement? Um, I encourage everyone before this presentation to download your social security statement, but I'll show you how it looks and what numbers we want to look at when we're trying to figure out how much money we, that we can anticipate from social security. And then another question to think about is, do we plan to work in any capacity? Because um, if you still choose to, you know, let's, first of all, let's talk about what is retirement. It's not just like, you know, sitting on, the, the front porch on a rocking chair and waiting for my grandchildren to come over. A lot of folks, a retirement idea is, you know, maybe now you're starting a business. Maybe you're living your passion. Maybe you're at this point, you know, um, traveling the world. So, or, or maybe you just want to do something fun, like be a bartender or something. You just don't want to work your regular, you know, nine to five or whatever you're doing. But if you choose to still work in retirement and it's totally fine, um, it will also affect your social security, but it's also income that we could factor in as well. So again, just a couple more questions to consider. So this is the main thing that I want you to all take heed to tonight is what sources of income will you have in retirement? And as I go through this information, I want you to start thinking about what do you have? What do you currently have as far as your retirement savings and how will we be able to apply it to reach that goal, that monthly goal? That's all we, that's all we care about is if I need $5,000 to live for the rest of my life, I think I'll be okay. What sources of income will you have money coming from to determine that, to, to, to make up that $5,000. So from a financial planning perspective, when it comes to retirement, there's really two sources of income that I look at. Number one uh, is fixed income. And that's basically what we call, I put in air quotes, quote unquote, guaranteed sources of income, income that we can pretty much rely on that will always be there and that we don't have to worry about. And then we have other income or your personal savings. So with fixed income, that could be your pension. Because remember I said, if you have a pension, if you're lucky, that's supposed to be a source of uh, income that your job, your employer should be paying out to you for the rest of your life. Social security. Um, it's from, you know, good old government. That's income that we've earned and qualified for. 
And then another source of income, fixed income, remember my definition of fixed is basically guaranteed, would come from annuities. So annuity income payments. Um, I do realize a lot of folks probably don't have an annuity outright. That's something you probably you know, get into when you retire or prior, right before you retire. But I'm gonna talk about that and how does that factor in. And then when I look at other sources of income, for me, these are things that are not necessarily guaranteed. <laughs> um, your workplace retirement accounts, so your 401k, 403b, 457, deferred compensation plans. Why do I say those aren't guaranteed? Because they're probably invested in the stock market. And if all things go to hell, you could lose that money. That's the reality of it. Um, obviously, that's probably not likely to happen, but it did happen back in 2008. A lot of folks are planning to retire. Nope, they're still working right now because they lost so much money in the stock market. Um, traditional or Roth IRAs, these are individual retirement accounts that you would generally open up on your own. And I'm gonna go through each one of these on a separate page, but I just wanna talk about it at high level. Um, again, those are investment accounts. So there is a potential that you could lose that money. That's why it's not guaranteed. Um, now, a safe way to put your money, save your money is in a, in a bank, um, checking account, savings account, CDs, or just have a money sitting in cash. Um, it's a very safe way to save your money, probably not the most wise or strategic because it's generally those, those, those type of accounts don't grow. And remember, we're trying to grow our money as much as possible so we can stay retired. And then another source of income, again, like I said, if you plan on working, you know, if that's working another job or self-employment or having your own business. So let's go through these different examples and how do we factor them in to determine how much money we need um, to make up for retirement. So a pension, um, even though these are not, I would say probably about 15% of employers actually still offer pensions. I do wanna talk about them because my audience um, ranges from government employees to union workers, and a lot of them actually still have uh, pensions. So a pension is actually a defined benefit plan. The key word here is benefit. It's a benefit that you earn through your employer. And this is where a company pays a retiree. You, you know, you're the one who's about to retire from that company. They pay you a specific benefit. That's in a dollar amount based on how many years you've worked at that company and also your salary level at that company. So that's why, as I mentioned, it's very important to know what that estimation is because the company will be able to let you know. Um, they'll say, oh, well, you've earned you know, $75,000 and this is what your income was while you've been working with us. This is what we can expect to pay you. A pension will pay you a retiree until they pass away. And so it's guaranteed income, it's supposed to be guaranteed income for life. Now, another factor about a pension is that you can also choose at retirement to say, you know what, I, in case, you know, let's say I'm married and I passed away early, I don't want that money to just disappear. Maybe I might take a reduction in the full benefit amount. Maybe I'll collect half while I'm alive. And then if I pass away, then my spouse or maybe another beneficiary could continue to receive that money until they pass away. So with pensions, you have options with how that money's actually paid out. Now, the one thing about pensions though, is that they're very, very, very costly for the employer. And this is why you don't see a lot of employers actually offer pensions anymore. Because remember that second bullet point, they have to pay that person who retired for the rest of their life. Now, when pensions were first initiated, folks only lived maybe 10 years in retirement and then they passed away. But with the advances in medical and healthcare, uh, folks are living a lot longer. Um, it's estimated that you can expect to be retired for the exact same amount of years that you actually worked. So if you work for 30 years, you can expect to be retired for 30 years. So it became very expensive for employers to continue to pay these pensions for long lifetimes. And that's why they're, stop, they're, <laughs> they're reducing them. Um, so any questions about a pension? I, I want to talk about that. But if you on here have a pension, and if you have an idea of what that is, 
I want you to, to that's something that we can depend on in retirement. So for example, like I, I'm going to use my $5,000. Remember I said, as an example, let's say in retirement, you think that you need $5,000 to continue paying all your bills and to do what you want. Let's say my pension will probably pay me about $2,000. Now, okay, great, $2,000 of my bills are covered, but now I have $3,000 left over to figure out, right? So if there aren't any questions, then I'm gonna talk about Social Security. So Social Security, um, this is actually benefits that are issued to you by the US government. And actually I'm gonna share a different screen on the Social Security. I can find it. Okay, so this is an example of a social security statement. Um, this one's actually from 2019. Uh, you should be getting these in the mail automatically. If you're not, you can go to ssa.gov. Actually, I'll put that in the chat. If you go to www.ssa.gov, um, I think it's like forward slash my account you can download your social security statement. And I encourage everyone to download their social security statement every single year. Um, and basically what the government says is, you know, thank you, Shantae, you worked all this time. Uh, we're, you, you contributed to our social security system. Now, I'm not gonna go into social security as a whole presentation in itself. I'm just gonna talk high level about it. Because if you're a government employee, you generally don't get social security. There's a windfall provision. It's a whole separate topic. But for most average corporate employer, worker, W-2 employee, um, you've contributed to the social security system. And our money, the monies that you put in, we're actually going to pay social security benefits for retirees who are collecting at that time. So like right now, me, I'm still in my late 30s. So my money that I put into the social security system is going to pay people who are collecting money right now. Um, I mentioned that because a lot of folks think that, oh, the social, like the money that comes out of your paycheck is going to an account strictly for you so that when you decide to retire, it's yours. No, it's not how it works. It's not how social security works. Um, but it's based on how much or how much your earnings have been, how long you have been working. There are credits. I think you have like 40 credits that you have to accumulate. And then basically the social security, you know, administration, they'll tell you if you choose to retire, you know, the earliest you could claim social security is age 62. Um, and they'll tell you right here that, oh, if you retire at 62 right now, based on how much you've earned, your income, we'll pay you $669 for the rest of your life. Um, if you wait till you're 70 to retire, wow, look at how much more money you get, almost $1,200. Full retirement age is now 67. Um, this can change in the future. It, it was previously 65, and in the last, I don't know, five plus so or years, it changed it to 67. It could change in the future. But if you wait till normal retirement age, full retirement age 67, then this example, this person would get $950 a month. So one thing with uh, Social Security is that the earliest you can start at 62, um, the longer you wait, the more money you receive. Now, there are a lot of factors, like if you're married or if you're divorced, if you've been married to somebody for 10 years that you can get their Social Security again. That's not for this webinar. I just wanna highlight what you can factor in because if you're planning to retire at 62, then you could say, oh, all right, if I need $5,000 a month, I know that I'll get $670 from social security. And again, that's where we can deduct that amount because again, it's guaranteed. We can automatically say, I know that you know, six, $700 of my need, my monthly need will be covered with social security. Now, the one thing I do wanna highlight about this is the fact that I don't know if we can depend on this. I know I'm definitely not. You, uh, most folks can. <laughs> I don't plan to because of this. Uh, the Congress, they already know that in retirement or in the Social Security Administration, they already know that there's not enough money um, to cover the current Social Security need, the current anticipation. They put it on your Social Security statement. This is not hidden anywhere. 
It says these benefits are just estimates based on current law because laws can change. Congress has made changes to the law in the past and they could do so at any time. The law governing benefits amount may change because by 2034, the payroll taxes that are collected, because remember us who are paying into payroll taxes right now are funding current folks who are taking money out. The current, uh, the payroll taxes that are currently being collected will only be enough to pay about 79% of scheduled benefits. So this is important to, to factor in because if I, you know, if I know I want to retire at 62, and they're telling me that, you know, I can get $669. Well, wait a minute. I actually won't be able to. Um, let me just share my calculator. I'm going to share my screen real quickly. So based on what the Congress, you know, what they're telling me is that, okay, I will get the full 69, you know, 669. I'm actually going to get, going to get 79% of that, which means I will actually only probably might get $528. And that's a reality that we have to consider. Now, it's been said time and time in the past that, um, you know, Congress couldn't afford to pay Social Security. Um, but I just I always point that out to folks um, because I, and this was based in 2019. I think it's maybe 2034. Maybe it might be changed by a year. But we know a lot of folks are depending on Social Security. Um, and Social Security is a lot of folks' only source of income. And oftentimes, it's not enough. Like, they're barely struggling with just that alone. Imagine their benefits being reduced by 20%. Um, so again, but can we factor it in? Yes, I, def I definitely want you all to factor it in as saying this is something that I anticipate to get. But obviously knowing that Congress, the government, they have to figure out new ways to, uh, you know, take that burden off of the, the population, um, you know, so that we don't have to worry about our benefits being reduced. So I always recommend folks, you know, if you want to maximize this, try to wait to age 67. If not, your earliest to start claiming is at age 62. Um, I'm gonna pause. Any questions about social security? Any, any questions? Yes, the social security benefits until um, you die as well, just like your pension. Mm -hmm. And yes. it has beneficiaries just like... No beneficiaries. No? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. um, but my understanding, no, I don't think anyone's social security, I mean, I think disability, that's different, but um, I, I don't think your social security can continue to anyone else. Double check that though. I'm not a social security um, expert. It might go to your spouse, but I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think it goes on. You think otherwise, Russell? Um, when my stepfather passed away my mother got his social security okay as well as his military benefits yeah and that's what i said i think it's different when you're married um and this is why when you yeah yeah spouses can get it but not okay thank you and that that could be very well correct like i said i'm not the social security expert but um, I know in my office, we have some folks who will come and do presentations only on social security and I'll definitely invite everyone to those. But um, if you've been married, I think there's a certain factor like you could claim your spouse's benefit amounts. There's a lot of variations. I always tell clients, you wanna to go to the social security office and have them go through the different scenarios because there's so many different scenarios that you could get a dollar amount in this one, a different dollar amount in this one. Um, but that's a really good question, Tammy. But as far as you, yes, it'll pay until you pass away. <laughs> um, I do know that for sure. So let's move on. So let's talk about annuity. Um, these are, Okay, everything popped up all at once. That's totally fine. Um, so when it comes to an annuity, I like these. This is, again, it's a tool. It's a strategy. Do they work for everyone? No. But for a lot of folks, especially in retirement, they make sense. Um, an annuity is a contract with a life insurance company. Um, not a life insurance product. It's not insurance. It's a, it's a issue through a life insurance company. And what you basically do is you give the insurance company a lump sum amount of money. 
And then they say, okay, thank you, Shate. You gave us this $100,000, whatever that is. Um, we're going to actually turn that lump sum amount of money into lifetime income payments for you. Uh, I really like these for uh, individuals who are closer to retirement, ages 50 and older. However, because of some of the safety and guarantees with the coming in annuity, I have clients as young as 34, 35 who are opting in for this option as well. Uh, but for those close to retirement, definitely a great option to consider. Um, so where do you get that lump sum from? That's generally for those of you who have an old 401k, or maybe you have a traditional IRA that you accumulated, right? You have this amount of money that you accumulated. You can generally roll those, not generally, you can roll those over into an annuity. Uh, we basically uh, take it out the hands of your employer and put it uh, and transfer that money to the insurance company. Same thing with your traditional IRA. We we'll roll it over to the insurance company and they would use that lump sum to create the contract for you. Now, why do people do this? Because it mostly, when you're getting close to retirement, the one thing that you really got to avoid is losing your money <laughs> um, and continuing to invest it in the stock market. Um, for some folks, that's a great strategy, especially if you're active, what well, we do active money management. Um, but for others, you really do, you, you, most folks want to put their money in a position where they can't lose it. Um, and a lot of annuities will give you that downside protection. So meaning if the stock market drops, you don't lose any money in your annuity. Now there's different types and I'm not going to go through all different types, but you do have some protection to where you can't lose money. And then again, they, the, annuity, the insurance company will still take that lump sum amount of money and they'll continue to grow it. Um, but then once that amount is, you know, let's say you keep put it in an annuity for six, seven years, and then that six, seven years, it's still continuing to grow. It's not just sitting in cash, um, but then now you're about to retire. That's when we could push a button. And then the, based on how much that annuity has grown from those lump sum amounts of money that you put in, now the insurance company can say, okay, now you gave us 100,000, now it's 150,000. We're actually gonna be able to guarantee you income for life based off of that new value, that 150,000 you know, value that it has grown to. Um, and that growth is calculated in so many different ways based on whatever type of annuity you have, whether it's a fixed annuity, a fixed annuity means just that you get like a fixed interest rate, um, maybe three, four, five percent fixed. Um, index um, annuities they grow according to how indexes perform that uh, follow the stock market. Maybe you might get five, six, seven percent growth, and then you have variable annuities which are actually invested in the stock market, and you'll get upwards of the eight, nine, ten percent plus uh, growth. Now, which one works for you? That's when you want to sit down with somebody like myself and we'll work you through that. But I really, really like annuities because of that guaranteed income feature. This is basically you creating your own pension for yourself. Um, again, does it work for everybody? No, some folks, annuity doesn't make sense, but for a lot of folks, it does. So when I have some clients who... Maybe they left old jobs. Maybe they pop, you know, have changed careers and they have these, they have their 401k still sitting at their old employer. Sometimes I might recommend this to them so that that money can now, we take control over it. We could continue to grow it, but we have a lot of guarantees built into, um, into this product that I can comfortably tell them, okay, in retirement, now I know that, you know, you'll get another $2,000 of income, um, from your annuity. And we can calculate that for you. Now, um, the income portion, it, it, it depends on the growth, but we can give you a pretty, a pretty good estimate of what we can expect that income benefit amount to be. So you have your pension, you have your social security, and then you might have another third stream of income coming from your annuity. And that again, would round up all of your fixed income sources in retirement. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. Yes, go so, ahead. Um, what about if you have a deferred compensation? Can you roll that over into a annuity? Yes. Oh. Yep. So what so an annuity is a the, um it's a tax deferred product. Um 
And the monies that generally go into an annuity will come from other tax deferred accounts. So anything at your job, those are tax deferred investment accounts, uh, IRAs, those are tax deferred investment accounts and deferred comp, same thing. So when you uh, choose to leave the employer, you're basically moving into another tax deferred uh, product and there's no taxable event to do that. Now, with that being said, remember, at no point have you paid taxes, right? So when you do start to pull your money out of the annuity, that's when you pay your taxes. Um, so you, you, this again, you probably don't, you don't want to touch this to your 59 and a half, just like your other retirement accounts uh, to avoid any penalties because the IRS, they want you to have this money set aside for retirement. So they don't want you touching this no time soon until you do plan to retire. Uh, a question that came in earlier was about, uh, there are some folks who advocate uh, to stay away from annuities. <laughs> um, the, a couple of folks, uh, Susie Warman is one of those. Uh, another social person mentioned was Dave Ramsey. Um, actually, Susie Warman just retracted her statement probably about two years ago. I think when folks say that, it's just because they've seen a lot of people kind of being taken advantage of by annuities, um, by individuals selling folks annuities that they shouldn't have been because a lot of seniors used to get abused with annuity products. Like say, for example, you're a senior and you're eight, you know, you're 80 years old. Um, a lot of these annuities have about a five, six, seven year window where they don't want you touching it. Um, and then there's a surrender period and fees associated if you do. So in the past, a lot of seniors used to be taken advantage of when they needed that money and whoever sold them the annuity uh, was basically causing that person to get all these taxes and penalties that could have been avoided had they went to a different product. But um, I think if as long as folks are educated, it makes perfect sense in very, very many good situations. Um, I'm not biased against them at all, at all. Um, I like the guaranteed income. I just look at what's that outcome. If I put my money in this product, what can I expect from it? And if I can expect guaranteed income in retirement, then I'm okay with that as long as it fits in my plan. And I understand how it works. So I'm gonna move on and again, continue to put your questions in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. So let's talk about those other types of accounts. Because remember, I, when we talked about fixed income, you know, those are sources of income that we know, no matter what, they should be there. My annuity incomes, my social security, and maybe if I have a pension, if you're lucky enough to have a pension. Um, now, what about other accounts, other places that I can save my money? A lot of us save our money through the job. Um, these are defined contribution plans. Remember the pension was a defined benefit plan. That was a benefit that the employer gives you. Uh, these workplace retirement accounts are defined contribution plans where it's actually, instead of the employer giving you the benefit, they've changed the responsibility onto you. You're the one who has to actually actively contribute to these plans. Um, so how do these work? These workplace plans are basically these are all investment accounts where it allows you as an employee to make pre-tax contributions to your own retirement account. Um, why is pre-tax beneficial? Because um, we avoid any money that goes somewhere before taxes, you're gonna get your greatest benefit from. So I have some clients who say, well, I don't want my money to be coming out because you know I'm gonna miss it in my paycheck. I'm like, no, not really, because the money comes out prior to taxes. So you probably wouldn't even notice a big difference in being able to contribute You know, when you do make a contribution to this retirement account. Uh, another caveat is that, remember, the employers put it on you to, to save for your own retirement, um, and they're not even required to match your contribution. Some um, employers have an option to match what you put in up to a certain amount. It's not required of employers at all. It's an option. Luckily, most employers will match what you contribute. They might match up to 6% of what you contribute, up to a certain dollar amount of your income. They normally max it out. I always recommend to my clients, if you have a 401k, if you have this as an option at your workplace, take advantage of it, contribute up to the match, whatever the employer matches, and that's it. 
no more. Don't put in any more uh, because if you have more to save, then we can save that elsewhere. Uh, but why would people, um, you know, put money in here? Well, because they can put a significant amount of money um, into this account. Um, actually, I didn't update this. You can contribute up to $19,500 of your income. This is actually for 2021 as well. Um, and if you're over age 50, they allow you to put in a little more so you can catch up. They call it a catch up provision. So you could contribute up to $26,000. Um, and again, those are retirement uh, investment accounts. Another uh, feature about those workplace retirement accounts is, again, they're tax deferred. So they're growing, they're invested, they're growing, and you're not paying taxes. So because your taxes are deferred to later, um, it's a really great way to build up, accumulate wealth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you do have the option to leave the job. You know, what if I leave the job? What happens to my retirement account? Well, you definitely have some options um, to roll it over. Um, you can roll it over to your new employer's 401k plan. You could take that amount of money, put it in there. I don't recommend that. Um, you could put it into a traditional IRA. It's an individual retirement account. Again, it's an investment account that you would establish on your own and you could continue to invest it from there. That's a good option for most folks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you could also put it into an annuity. An annuity is actually a product that could go inside of a traditional IRA. Um, so it maintains it in that tax deferred status. As I mentioned, that's a great option as well. Um, I don't think I put it on here. Nope, I did. Two other options. You can leave it. You can leave it at the old employer and it'll just invest however you invested it. The employer should be sending you at least quarterly statements. Um, I don't recommend that because once you leave a job, you have full control of that retirement money, even though you're not retirement age. Uh, retirement age when it comes to investments is 59 and a half. Um, but I don't recommend that. You want to take control of any money that's available to you. Or you could cash it out. You could, you could just cash it out and you know walk away with the check. But if you do that, um, not only will you pay taxes, It'll be included in your taxable income for the year. You'll also have a 10% penalty. So we try to avoid that as well. Any questions about workplace retirement accounts? We're good? Okay. So let's talk about traditional IRA um, because a lot of folks will say, well, should I take it? I do an IRA, you know, what does that do for me? Um, sure. Again, this is an individual retirement account. And one thing I want to, before I talk about it, um, I'm going to talk about IRAs for a couple of slides. You can open an IRA at basically any financial or investment institution, at your bank, at online, with me. Um, the things that I'm sharing apply to IRAs across the board, because the guidelines of how this investment account is managed is determined by the IRS. And so these are all IRS guidelines. It doesn't matter where you open your IRAs, again, whether it's with myself or elsewhere, these rules apply. Now, first rule is that this account is intended for retirement. Um, the IRS is trying to say, let's give folks a way to save for their retirement and give them a benefit for doing, you know, being for, you know, saving money on their own. Um, because you got to think about it. Ultimately, the IRS's goal is that you do not rely on the government to, to take care of your retirement. They want folks to be proactive and save for their own retirement. Now, because this is intended for retirement, the IRS says like, look, we don't want you touching this money before age 59 and a half. But if you do, we're going to slap your head and hit you with a 10% penalty. So it's not to say that your money isn't accessible to you. You can absolutely get it. Um, but the IRS, they because they want you, to, they want to penalize you because they don't want you touching it before 59 and a half. And if you wait until 59 and a half or any withdrawal that you take will be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. Um, and what does that mean? That basically says that whatever money you withdraw is added to your income for that year and you pay ordinary income tax rates on that. Um, so right now our highest tax rate is 39.6%. Um, depending on what your tax bracket is, maybe it's 22, 25. So you have to remember if I'm using an IRA for retirement, I have to factor in how much of that I'm, am I actually keeping because I have to pay taxes. 
uh, with uh, IRAs, you can contribute up to $6,000 per year. And this is on your own by adding additional deposits. This does not include rollovers or transfers. This is adding in additional monies per year. And then again, if you're over age 50, the IRS will allow you to add an additional $1,000 for a total of $7,000. Now, one cool feature, one benefit that the IRS gives you is that for saving money for your retirement, in most instances, you are able to actually deduct a portion of that $6,000 or $7,000 against your income for tax reporting purposes. Um, this is when you want to sit with the tax person because if you're married, it depends on how much your income is, your adjusted gross income. But most folks will be able to deduct a portion of what they actually put in for their taxes. So that's a tax benefit that the IRS gives you. Um, however, remember, these accounts are tax deferred. You don't pay taxes until you pull your money out. But what if you're well off in retirement and you're living the life and you're like, I don't need money out of my IRA. I don't, I don't have to pull money out. I'm not taking anything out. Well, the IRS says, you know what, Shante, you can't delay paying taxes. We are going to force you to start taking out required minimum distributions at age 72. They're called RMDs. They're going to say, look, that's great. You're fine, but that money's not going to keep growing and you're not paying any taxes on it. Um, and this is a, a huge thing because um, if you don't take out your RMD, you actually will be penalized 50% of the amount that you should have taken out in addition to the taxes. So I don't, I don't have this issue with any of my clients. They, they pull their money out right away, um, but we will get notified um, you'll definitely get notified from your financial institution. Hey, you need to start pulling money out or else you're going to pay that hefty penalty. Now, another thing that's huge with the traditional IRA is that you also have the option to convert it to a Roth IRA, which I'll talk about on the next screen. And why would somebody want to do that? Because a Roth IRA, which you'll learn, is a tax, uh, a tax, uh, a tax-free investment account. Um, once monies are in a Roth IRA, you don't pay any taxes on it ever anymore in the future. So a lot of folks like to say, well, I'm paying taxes on this traditional IRA money when I pull it out. Well, how can I put my money into a tax-free position? And I'll talk about that conversion. So I'm going to look at a couple questions in the chat. Anyone have any questions about a traditional IRA? Oh, bye, Russell. I'll send you the recording. Thank you so much for joining. Any other questions about traditional IRA? Okay, I'll move forward. So let's talk about a Roth IRA. So very, very, oh, well. okay, question came in. Can you roll over and defer comp into a Roth IRA? No, you have to put it into a traditional IRA first because we're taking, so I did put a picture, I have a visual that shows like how you can move money. Um, the deferred comp is with the employer. So we have to move the, the deferred comp out of the employer's hands first into a similar tax structured account. And the similar account is the traditional IRA. And then once the money is in the traditional IRA, you'll be able to convert it to a Roth IRA. And I'll talk about how that conversion actually works. Really good question. Okay, so one thing about the Roth IRA is that any money that you put in, you are able to access those contributions at any time without penalty. Um, and I think my next line talks about how much you can put in. Yes, so just like a traditional IRA, you can also contribute up to $6,000 per year into your Roth IRA. Um, so let's say you put in the whole 6,000 in 2021 up, you know, to date. Um, and if you need to pull that money out, if it's there, the reason why I say if it's there, it's because it's invested. So hopefully it didn't drop below $6,000, but as long as that $6,000 is there, you're able to pull it out. But the goal is not to do that, but I just want folks to know that that's an option, uh, for you. The one thing that's different from a Roth IRA is that you cannot deduct any of those contributions against your income for tax reporting purposes like the traditional IRA. So the traditional IRA, you are able to you know, deduct 
up to that six, seven thousand dollars. But the Roth IRA, um, you don't have that. Um, and why? Because you get other benefits from your Roth. One, there are no required minimum distributions. So you could invest in a Roth IRA, never pull money out. The IRS isn't going to bother it. They're not going to bother you. You could you know, pass away and that money will go over to your beneficiaries. Um, they do not have any required minimum distributions. Um, and before I talk about the, the conversion, the benefit of the Roth IRA is that it just like a traditional IRA, it grows, it's tax deferred. So your earnings that you have, your growth, you don't pay any taxes. And as long as you pull the money out after age 59 and a half in retirement, you don't pay any taxes either. So this Roth IRA falls into what I call my tax-free investment account. It's a very, very unique benefit that a lot of folks can take advantage of. A Roth IRA makes sense for pretty much 99% of the population. There's a lot more uh, features to a Roth IRA. I'm just not going into them today. Uh, but that's the benefit of having it. You, you can save money for retirement. And in retirement, you don't pay taxes on the money that you pull out. Now, when you do a conversion, remember I mentioned, let's say you have that traditional IRA, because remember any money in a traditional IRA, you have to pay taxes on when you pull it out. Some folks say, well, I wanna have that Roth. I don't wanna pay taxes when I pull it out. Fine, we can, we can convert the money from the traditional IRA. We basically take that tax hit now. You know, Let's say you had $100,000 in traditional IRA. We pay taxes on that whole entire amount, that $100,000, take the tax hit now. And then whatever is left over will go into the Roth IRA. And then moving forward, you don't have to pay any more taxes on that money as it continues to grow. And when you decide to start pulling it out in retirement. Okay. Any questions about the Roth IRA before I go through, we're going to go through an exercise. Is this helpful so far? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to put in the chat and I will send this again to everyone. So I apologize if you're on your phone and you can't. Oh, no, that's not the right. Oops, sorry. That was not what I wanted to share. Don't click on that first link. That was to a flyer. Okay. Uh, click on the second link to a Google Drive. Um, document if you're on a computer. If you're not, don't worry, I'm about to pull it up now so that you could see it. And this is basically a retirement planning guide. Um, I share this, I've been sharing it more recently in my retirement planning webinars so that folks can have something to print out and just have, you know, paste it on your wall so that you can start thinking about some of this stuff because I'm not going through every single thing for retirement, I'm really just trying to make sure that we talk about how do we figure out how much money we need. So uh, these, uh, this is from a national nonprofit that I do work with called the Heartland Institute of Financial Education. Uh, they specialize in teaching financial literacy workshops to adult learners at the workplace. Um, I have taught, I don't know how many workshops through there. I met a lot of you through, uh, through my work with Heartland, but I love this guy. Um, these rules are key rules, you know, don't be in a hurry, protect your assets, talk about plan for taxes, um, expect a moderate return on investments. Because remember, even though you retire, your money will still be growing. We're, we're not going to just pull it all out at once. Anticipate longevity. And that's another thing. That's another reason why I like the annuity um, is because the annuity pays as long as you live as well. So our, a lot of folks, um, biggest fear in retirement is outliving their money. <laughs> they literally are more worried about running out of money than dying. So um, we want to make sure that you have financial tools and vehicles that will help you, um, you know, that you can keep to where you don't outlive your money. And then also transferring the remainder. Um, what the, the webinar I did a few weeks ago about estate planning about trust. Um, at the end of the day, any retirement accounts, you want to designate a beneficiary on any retirement accounts, um, because if you don't use that money, that money can then go to your beneficiary. Um, and that's something that we all, you know, you work hard for and you don't use it all, at least it can go on to your loved ones. But this is what I want to actually focus on today. Um, and again, I'm going to send you all this worksheet. 
but this is what I want you to start kind of filling out in your head. Uh, what do I expect my expenses to be in retirement? And as you see, it has two columns with now, you know, write down what are you paying now? And this is a good activity just for in general, just to get an idea of where you are. Uh, what are you paying now? And what do you anticipate to be paying in the future? Um, because it's often, some folks will say, oh, my bills would dramatically decrease in retirement. And statistics actually show that it's the opposite. Your bills will actually increase in retirement because now you're doing more, you're eating out more, you're traveling more, you're actually, you know, you're splurging on the grandchildren more. And again, I don't know what that looks like for you. That's not for me to tell you, but I do want you to just kind of take, you know, we're going to pause for a moment. I want you just to kind of start thinking about how much money do I actually need? You know, I talked about it earlier, if it's $5,000, um, one question I always ask folks, do you plan on downsizing? Because some folks um, sell their house and then they get in a small condo. Um, you probably won't pay the same amount in mortgage or rent. Do you plan on moving? You know, what are your property taxes going to look like? Uh, will you get rid of cable? Will your car be paid off? You know, in retirement, a lot of our debts might be actually paid off. That's the goal at least. So that's why it's important to calculate the numbers for now and in the future. I think the biggest category would be entertainment. Again, you know, you're not cooking every day. <laughs> uh, you're going out to dinner at nice restaurants a lot more. You're traveling more. You're gifting more. That's probably where most folks will actually see a change in their um, in their expenses. So am I sharing? Okay, yeah, I'm sharing this properly. So I'm just going to take a moment while you all do that to go through this. Does anyone want to share? Now that you're kind of like thinking about the numbers, <clears throat> Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever even thought like, hmm, how much do I actually need to live off of on the future? Yeah, this is Tammy. I'm actually planning to pay my mortgage off before I retire, but I don't know what my property taxes will be in the future. I mean, I can estimate probably, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um they seem to go up every year. <laughs> yeah. But, um, some of the stuff like cable TV, and mm -hmm. uh, I can really get rid of that. It starts to make you think, like, what can I cut right now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a home, home phone, cable TV. Uh, I think I'll always have a car note because. I don't know. I just like to have a new car all the time. <laughs> and that's totally fine. Yeah. yeah. But at least we can calculate it into your future monthly amount. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is calculate what are our total expenses going to be? Mm -hmm. Because once we know that amount, um, then that's, what, that's when we can work backwards to say, okay, if I need $5,000 a month, I know I'll get a thousand from social security. I know that, you know, Shantae will help me open an annuity and I'll get another 2000 from that in my pension or whatever else. So that's where we work backwards from mm -hmm. to figure that out. So yeah, thank you for sharing. I think it's good at any time to just kind of check in and think about where your money's going in general. So let's talk about another expense. I'm really just going to briefly touch on this topic. Uh, get back to my slideshow. It's to talk about healthcare expenses because this is going to be your second biggest expense um, in retirement. And I want to talk about what options do you have? And again, I'm not going to go too deep on this, but I do want to touch on that. Because a lot of folks just assume that their health insurance, well, first of all, if you're no longer working, um, you may or may not have access to that health insurance from your previous employer. Some employers can carry it over. There's a cost for that. Some of them do it for free. Sometimes you're done. You have no health insurance. Um, this one, we have to look at sources that are offered by the government. 
or you self-insure yourself. But I wanna talk about Medicare and Medicaid for a moment because I think a lot of folks make assumptions about these and they don't do what we think they're going to do. Um, so Medicare, actually, let me start with a different slide first. Start with this one. Okay, Medicare versus Medicaid. This is from one of my, I'm switching between presentations just so you know. So Medicare, this is a health insurance program that's administered by the federal government for individuals who are 65 years or older, um, as well as some disabled America, Americans and people with kidney failure. So Medicare, this is not something that you'll automatically get just because you've retired. Um, you have to be 65 or older to even get Medicare. Um, so what does that mean? Let's say you retire at 60. What do you do for four or five years? Again, that's where you want to look to see what options your employer offers you because some of them will maintain health insurance for you. But we want to make sure you don't go uninsured at any point. Um, Medicaid, on the other hand, this is a government medical assistance program that's offered by the federal and state governments. This is actually a social service program for those who are financially destitute um, and who need medical assistance. So there is no age requirement for Medicaid. You could be 18 years old or a family, you know, a young mom with her children could be on Medicaid. Um, but to qualify for that, you pretty much have to have very little to no assets. It's like a $2,000. You can't really have like no more than $2,000 in anything as far as assets to qualify for Medicaid. So it's really like for very you know low income families, folks who just don't have any financial means or resources. Um, now, as someone who's in retirement, can you look to both of these? Yes, but most folks um, generally won't qualify for Medicaid because they just have too much in assets. And um, sometimes they'll try to like transfer out their assets to maybe another family member. Oh, I'll put the house in my child's name or I'll you know, transfer my investment account to somebody else. A lot of times the government will actually look back, um, I believe up to five or seven years one of those, they'll look back to see what did you own in the past couple of years. Um, again, they wanna make sure that these, these benefits are going to people who actually qualify for them. Now, I don't have any judgment on anybody qualifying for Medicaid or Medicare. Take advantage of them if you qualify. I always tell folks that there's no need to struggle when these programs are available to you. But what does Medicare actually cover? Because a lot of folks will say, oh, I don't need insurance when I get older. I'll be fine. Or, um, you know, the government will take care of me. Well, let's look at what do they actually cover. So Part A Medicare is for medical insurance for going to the hospital, you know, and it's basically free for most people. That's, you know, so if you're 65 and let's say you don't have a lot of money, you'll get Medicare Part A for free um, automatically. Now, part B is what you would actually pay for. Um, that's for doctor visits and other healthcare providers. So more of your specific needs that you need to have taken care of, you would pay for part B. And again, the cost varies. Um, it could be like $60 a month, $100 a month. I think the most is 106. I'm not a Medicare specialist. I could do it, but it's, it's too many. There's too many things to remember. <laughs> uh, I think the most, the last time I checked, it was like $106 is like the most, maybe 200. Don't quote me on that. But at the end of the day, it's not free. Part D covers prescription drugs. Um, and Part C, which is Medicare Advantage, that's a hybrid of A, B, and D. Now, when you think Medicare, you think PPO, like your health insurance at work, PPO insurance. Um, you know, you can PPO, you have to go to like a certain doctor, a certain network, or else, you know, it's out of network. Medicare Advantage is more encompassing. So think HMO, you have a little more freedom about where you can go. Now, um, oh yeah, and then you can also buy Medicare supplements, which is Medigap. Um, cause there's like part G F L there's so many letters. Again, I'm not the Medicare specialist. If this is something you really, really, really want to know about, 
let me know. I'll, I have a good friend of mine. This is all she does every day, all day. She knows it in and out, but I know enough to just talk about it. But again, there's also Medicare supplements that you can um, buy to bridge the gap, especially if you have very uh, specific uh, healthcare issues and you have very, you know, things that you really need covered. That's when you want to really look into the supplements. Now, what does Medicare uh, actually cover? Medicare does not cover deductibles, co-pays, and insurance. So you're likely to have something to come out of pocket if you only have Medicare insurance to, you know, when you visit the doctor. It, uh, Medicare also does not cover for long-term care expenses. And that's what it says here. Medicare does not cover when it is primarily for the purpose of helping with daily living or meeting personal needs. Another term for long-term care needs. That will be um, assistance with walking, bathing, eating, taking your medication, going to the bathroom, dressing yourself, transferring. Transferring is like getting up out of the bed or getting out of a chair. If you need help doing that, um, you qualify for assistance. You qualify for long-term care. Um, it also will not cover occasional nursing care where you have to have a skilled medical personnel come into your home and help you with certain things. Um, that's where you actually want to have long-term care insurance. Um, and I talk about this to my, reti my retire, uh, individuals think about retirement because that's something that I often factor into your plan. You know, if you're saving, I'm all nine times out of 10, I'm going to recommend that you also save for uh, long-term care insurance. And you don't, and there's so many ways to cover that, but I wanted to talk about this because healthcare, the number one way to eat up all your savings in retirement is paying for healthcare and, and medical needs. Um, med Medicare also covers less than 2% of daily nursing care required. So most folks in retirement, they're not like on their deathbed. They're not like super sick. They just need a little help. And most folks, you know, want to get that help at home, have a little dignity. They don't necessarily need to be in a nursing home. They just need some assistance a couple of days a week. Uh, Medicare doesn't generally cover those types of things. Okay, so let me switch back to my original slide. Um, so again, just another version of what does Medicare pay for? It pays for, um, it pays for healthcare when these four conditions are met. The patient needs intermittent skill nursing care, physical therapy, or speech language. The patient is confined to his or her home. The patient, the doctor determines that they need care. And the home care. And the home health agency providing care participates in Medicare. Again, Medicare doesn't pay for full-time nursing care or drugs. They don't prepare for meal prepping or helping folks get food. They do not pay for services to assist the patient like, you know, housekeeping, cleaning up for themselves or shopping. So again, I, I wanted to touch on this very briefly tonight because healthcare costs can be very, very expensive. So when we're looking at, you know, what am I paying for um, medical, dental, those costs can add up. And I know folks who currently deal with having to take care of loved ones, um, you know, because they don't have someone by their side 24 seven. So that's another separate conversation. I didn't want to get too into the weeds for it, but if you're interested in learning more about long-term care or if it makes sense for you or how can we take care of that for you now because you want to qualify for it now, um, not when you get sick, not when you actually need this stuff, um, then definitely reach out to me and we'll talk about that further. Any questions about any of that? Or anyone? Okay, thank you. So, oh, good. I'm at the end. So, as you can see, there are no one size fits all strategies. This is a little blurry, but everyone's situation is totally different. Um, it depends on the lifestyle that you want to have, savings that you have, and Again, what can we afford? Um, I talked a lot about the accounts and how to calculate how much you need. But ultimately, if you have savings, if you know there's a gap, right? Um, I'll just stop sharing for a second. 
if you know there's a gap, you need 5,000, but you only have three, there's $2,000 we got to fill. That's when you want to take advantage of talking to somebody like myself so that I can walk you through, okay, how do we fill that gap? If I need to generate another $2,000 of income in retirement, how can I do that? Or how can I get closely to that? Because otherwise, the conversation will be, well, do I need to change my expected lifestyle? Or do I need to rethink, you know, how much longer do I plan to work? Um, because again, if you have those things covered now from other sources, then great, you can retire. But you really want to just look at what do I, how do I expect to live in retirement and what sources of income uh, will I have? So yeah, anyone have any questions? Any questions at all? Let me share my screen. Um, if you are not currently working with me, um, as always, I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you all to talk about your individual situation. You can go to this website, I'll actually post it in the chat, and uh, schedule a complimentary consultation with me. Um, it's 30 minutes, it's no obligation, it's over the phone, it's just for me to get an idea of what you know what your current situation is if i could be of assistance to you um you know answer any questions from today's presentation or any of my other materials that i share from time to time i'll be happy to talk with you about any of that um but yeah i'm going to I'll post that link in the chat any questions was this helpful was this helpful to everybody you feel at least a little more confidence I think that's the biggest thing. Being more confident. Okay. Well, if there are any questions, we're just going to end a little early. Um, I will. Oh, I have a question. Thank you, Shante. Yeah, of course. Um, I have a question. It may sound silly, but how do we get this? Um this link out of the chat do we highlight it and oh you could just click you should be able to click on it with your mouse oh okay but i'm going to send the retirement planning guy i'm going to attach that to the email that i send in the morning with the slides okay so you'll get that you'll get that automatically oh. okay well i thank you all for joining me tonight i appreciate you um i hope this was helpful if there's anything that i didn't touch on let me know i, I i'm planning to do another series in August. Um, if I need to redo something to add more, uh, I always appreciate folks input, but I appreciate everyone for joining tonight. Thank you. 